I started introducing myself. My name's Alistair. I think that's my name earlier. I grew up in country New South Wales. I moved to Canberra to study engineering. I lived on residence for a couple of years and I moved into a share house. Through my studies in engineering, I came across this plan or these, this group when I was doing a renewable energy course. I thought it was really interesting and I developed some passion through it through my studies. And uh, last year, there was the opportunity to sort of learn and get involved with it and become a speaker. And so I attended this thing, so sort of not really expecting to get into it, but I thought it's one of those things you should do. And so then I did it, and now here I am. So hopefully this will be good. Um, feel free to ask any questions at any time, if it's about what's on the slide or what I'm talking about. If you have another question that's maybe a little bit more off topic, could you please just wait to the end, and then we'll have plenty of time to talk about them. Rebecca is here, she's my helper. She studies solar thermal energy at ANU, is that right? Yeah, right. And I studied in renewable energy and mechanics of properties and materials. So without further ado, I'll begin presenting the Zero Carbon Australia Stationary Energy Plan. Thank you, oh sorry, thank you to ASEN for organising this. Thank you for taking a seat. I would not have found this place at all. <laughs> Brilliant. So this plan is a research, I'm oh, sorry, I'm here to present the Zero Carbon Australia Stationary Energy Plan. I plan to move Australia's stationary energy to zero emissions within a decade. This plan is a research collaboration between the University of Melbourne's Energy Research Institute and Beyond Zero Emissions. Beyond Zero Emissions, or BZE for short, is a science-based, solutions-focused, non-for-profit research organisation. BZE is completely independent and largely volunteer-run, with about 300 volunteers around Australia. This number is growing all the time. These volunteers contribute their time pro bono to BCE's research and communication projects, such as this one today. We have a skeleton of paid staff and who act as research directors and volunteer coordinators. And we rely mainly on private donations of people making small monthly contributions. We call these people our base load supporters. <coughs> Here are just some of the contributors to the stationary energy plan at the launch in Melbourne last July. Award-winning, groundbreaking research forms the basis of all the BZE's work. Engineers, scientists, academics, and people working in the relevant industries contribute their time and effort voluntarily to put together the research backbone. The pro bono inputs of these experts are managed and coordinated by full-time research directors. BCE has formed a strategic partnership with the University of Melbourne Energy Research Institute and produced and published our major research work, the Zero Carbon Australia Land Project. Excuse me, but I have notes. <laughs> the Zero Carbon Australia Project, or ZCA, is a detailed roadmap for the transition of Australia to a decarbonised economy in 10 years. The latest and most credible research, and sorry, the latest and most credible science tells us that this transition is necessary if we want to maintain a safe climate. Scientists believe that the world is already fast approaching dangerous climate <coughs> There is no point in having targets that only half solve the problem too little, too late. Because we have to act now, we use only existing commercially available technology in this report. Promising emerging technologies such as geothermal, wave power, and other such research is still in developmental stages and therefore not implemented in this plan. Finally, the ZCA project specifies that the transition will have maintained the other capital and maintain these key indices. The ZCA project will publish six plans over three years, and together these plans will represent a comprehensive blueprint for the zero carbon future of Australia. The first of these plans that I'll talk about today is the stationary energy plan, which looks a little bit like this. Stationary energy is our electricity supply. It's where we plug our appliances in and run our electric trains and vehicles. This plan has received a stunning list of endorsements from organisations such as the International Energy Agency, leading Australians such as Sir Gustav Nossel and former Australian Chief Scientist Robert Betterham. It also won the Mercedes Benz Award in 2010 for environmental research. The next two plans, which Rebecca, they were released this year, weren't they? Uh, released later this year. Released later this year. Uh, of a transport and building plans. The ZCA project is shifting the debate on climate and energy in Australia. So I'm here to present an overview of the stationary energy plan. 
and using the seven main parts of the station energy plan as my reference, I'll answer these seven key questions. Why is 100% renewable energy in 10 years needed? What are the technologies that make this a reality? I will show the existing commercial available technology in Australia that we can use to reach 100% renewable energy in 10 years with a particular emphasis on the game-changing technology concentrated solar thermal energy with storage. Thirdly, we will examine the economic, labour and material requirements to see whether 100% renewable energy is achievable. And I'll give you a hint, the answer will be yes. <laughs> and lastly, we will look at how people can get involved to make this happen. Part one of the plan looks at the reasons behind the 100% target. The starting point was not about what is generally considered politically achievable, but what is necessary. This graph by Professor Hans Joachim Schellenhuber, the director of the Potsdam Institute, one of the world's most authoritative climate change research institutes, shows the rate of emissions reductions required if from selected countries if we are to only have a 67% chance of avoiding two degrees of global warming. The two degree guardrail, assuming we may have heard of it in politics, is the upper limit for global warming, beyond which our climate may become dangerously unstable. This allows for an equitable rate of global reductions to take into account current per capita emissions from level, different levels of countries. Schellen Huber's work shows that if every country had the same carbon budget from 2010, countries like the US, Australia and such would have to reduce more quickly due to their high current emissions. We accept that this is based on the best available science and we accept that global emissions need to be equitable. So, we accepted that for Australia, 10 years was the necessary time frame to transition to renewable energy. Oh, Steve, I just want to point out where Australia is. Oh, sorry. Um, where is Australia? <coughs> so it's the same as the US. Oh, we are the same as We should update these slides, sorry. <laughs> so we are proportionately uh, very greedy with our carbon emissions at the moment. Good one. Yeah, I think Australia is the highest. Right? Yeah, I think so as well. We would be up there in a couple of people. So let's talk, talk about what we first need to replace, which is traditional fossil fuel power generation. Traditionally, all of our energy has been produced by fossil fuels. In this simplified schematic, you can see that heat is generated in a boiler, which then boils steam and turns a turbine. This, uh, when this turbine turns, it produces the energy and this is what's consumed in your, your home. This process that we wish to propose works the same, except for one key point, the boiler. So we need renewable, zero emissions way to replace the way we create heat. And the research in the ZCA plan has shown that we can do this with concentrated solar thermal energy with storage. This is the P220, P20, PS20, sorry, concentrated solar thermal power plant in Spain. But how does it work? I'll briefly explain how solar concentrated thermal power technology works. Solar thermal power is an elegantly simple technology. It uses large mirrors, which you can see to the far right, called heliostats. Heliostats all track the sun and diffuse all of the sunlight into a central receiving tower, which you can see in the centre at the top. All of the, the central receiving tower takes all the energy from the mirrors that's concentrated from the sun and heats two tanks. We've got a hot tank and a cold tank. You can see also that the plant is being cooled. This upper image on the top left is a P20, PS20 heliostat at Spain, dwarfing our members at ZCA. Below is a heliostat field. A plant has many thousands of these heliostat field of heliostats located around the central receiver or tower, as seen here under construction at the Terra Solar plant in Spain. At the right is a heliostat. Excuse me. At the right is a heliostat in the German solar in action, concentrating the solar the sun's energy just to the right of the central receiver during testing. But how do we deal with the fact that the sun's energy doesn't shine all the time? How do we deliver round the clock base load power like traditional fossil fuel based energy, but without emissions and pollution that comes with it? Well, this is where combining the energy of concentrated solar thermal technology with molten salt storage 
comes into play. If we zoom into the relevant area of our original schematic, which I've done here, we can see that a working fluid called molten salt is pumped into the top of the tower, indicated by the yellow line. When it proceeds gets to the top, it becomes superheated to a degree of about 650 degrees. Salt is pumped, sorry, salt is pumped up from the cold tower, which is here to 565 degrees. The 565 degree molten salt is stored in a hot tank, which acts as a big insulated furnace. Whenever power is needed, hot salt is flashed past water to create steam. This steam then drives the turbine to produce energy. By storing the sun's energy in molten storage tanks, this allows for the bus to generate power around the clock 24 hours a day. This is what makes solar thermal power the game changing technology. Unlike solar photovoltaic power, as such as where I work with my company, which you might see on your neighbour's roof around Canberra or in fields or around Australia, you can't produce energy at night. Heat is much easier and cheaper to store than electrical energy. Also, the fact that the power tower technology generates the same temperatures as coal fired boilers means that the same generators and turbines can be used as in modern coal fired power plants. Here is the director of BC, Matthew Wright, holding the salt before it is melted down. The salt used in solar thermal storage is basically the same raw materials as what is used in industrial fertilizer. It is very common and an easily sourced material. To the left are the hot tanks from the outside. These are insulated large steel tanks acting as a very simple thermal battery. Below, you can see the inside of one of the tanks under construction. Solar thermal power with molten salt storage were proved, uh, proven in 1990s by the US Department of so Air Energy Solar 2 project. They, was, they successfully demonstrated that molten storage technology power can be used for three years from 1996 to 1999. This was ready to be ramped up to larger scale systems when unfortunately in the early 2000s, funding for the program from the US Department of Energy had ceased. However, a number of country companies bought the rights to the solar thermal technology from the US Department of Energy and have been rolling out this technology in Spain. One of these is the TerraSol Germasol plant. It has enough storage for 15 hours. That's base load power even in the middle of winter. This is renewable electricity that can be dispatched at any time of the day or night as needed. Germasolar is delivering the equivalent of 25,000 Spanish homes with zero emission electricity right now. As we see with another great view of the Germasolar plant, you can see that the power towers, the next, sorry, the next power towers are being built at different locations around the world, and because they are much larger, they're requiring less and less, and sorry, and because they are getting much bigger and we know what we are doing with them, they're requiring less and less investment. For example, the solar reserves tunnel path power tower system currently under construction will produce 100 megawatts of base load power uh, when it is connected to the grid in 2013. This plant will provide five times the power at only twice the cost. That's a 250% reduction in cost. The Germa Solar in Tanova are just two examples of the growth of solar thermal power in the world. As of July in 2011, around 17.54 gigawatts of projects of different configurations are under development worldwide. This would be enough capacity to provide over 70% of Australia's average power demand. The United States leads with about 8.67 gigawatts of projects either being built or under development, mainly in California and Nevada, and Spain ranks second with 4.46 gigawatts, followed by China at 2.5. The Spanish and Californian system is successful because their respective governments provide the right pricing support strategies to make this happen. These projects are being built by the biggest engineering and construction consortiums in the world. An investment is flowing from companies that are forward thinking, such as Siemens, General Electric, and Google. Another key commercially available technology is wind power. Right now, wind power is the cheapest and most technology, technologically mature technology there is. Here is Matthew Wright at the Estines Wind Farm in Del Belgium. These turbines are the exact turbines that are specified in the ZCA plan. 
skid oil and change my slime. Globally, wind has been increasing at around 30% a year for the last decade. Countries that are serious about their energy security are serious about wind power. China has a target of 150,000 megawatts of wind power by 2020. Denmark is aiming to use wind to supply half of their electricity by 2025. Currently, it supplies 20%. And in Sweden, about 1,100 turbines the same as the inner column turbines that are in this plant are being constructed right now. Now, I'll explain the second part of our ZCA project, which is the design and supply of the system. This explains how we use the plant uses the technologies in Australia. It is our vision of one scenario to repower Australia with 100% renewables in a decade. Before we look at the supply side, we need to look at the demand side. How much energy will Australia need to, improve, will need to produce in 2020 and how will we use it? While this is an entire section of the plan, due to time constraints, I won't be going into detail about this, but myself and Rebecca are happy to take questions about this afterwards. We took conservative benchmarks to allow, uh, for each of the, to allow us to, to size the demand for stationary energy, which will be 325 terawatt hours a year by 2020. More detail on this area will be contained in the transport and building plans that's coming out later this year. So we will move on to look at how the ZCA plan uses solar, wind and other technologies to create 100% renewable energy for Australia. There are three main components to the ZCA model. Concentrated solar thermal power, wind power and upgrading our existing electrical grid. The ZCA plan shows that 60% of Australia's 2020 energy demand can be met by concentrated solar thermal power with storage. The basic generation unit for the solar thermal system is a 220 megawatt tower module with up to 17 hours of, random, of storage for around the clock power. We link about 19 of these modules together to form a 3,500 megawatt plant or solar region. There would be 12 of these solar regions dispersed across Australia to supply 60% of Australia's stationary energy. The other 40% of Australia's energy in 2020 would be supplied by wind. Wind is the lowest cost, most technologically mature form of renewable energy, so the plan utilises as much wind as possible. This would require about 6,500 turbines dispersed across Australia. The plan identifies 23 of the best wind regions for good geographical diversity. So the resource mix that will make up Australia's 100% renewable station and the energy grid will be 60% solar thermal with storage, 40% of wind, with a small backup from crop waste to make biomass and also hydroelectricity. The ZCA plan includes detailed modelling which shows that backup is required less than 2% for less than 2% of the total energy supply. Of course, the renewable energy we produce from our solar and wind plants need to be delivered where it is used. This means that we need to modernise Australia's electricity grid. This investment is about one quarter of the total investment required under the ZCA plan. This is the renewable energy grid and generators that Australia could have in 2020 with the implementation of our plan. It connects the 23 wind sites and 12 solar thermal sites to take advantage of Australia's great natural resources. The red lines are the high voltage direct current or HVDC backbone and the green lines are the additional high voltage alternating current and the white lines are the existing grid. High voltage direct current is the same commercially available technology that currently connects Victoria and Tasmania in the Basilink undersea cable. The HVDC backbone effectively transmits energy over low, long distances with relatively low losses. This grid was reviewed by Sinclair Knight's events. So that's the grid, and now I'll explain the detailed modelling to show how we can meet Australia's full energy demand over an entire year, which is also part four of the plan. Detailed modelling was done over two years using half hour human solar measurements from the Bureau of Meteorology. This was combined with Australia's actual energy demand, scaled up to 2020 under the ZCA model. 
This startup is Super 2008. This black line represents Australia's actual energy demand for 2008, sourced from the national, in, uh, national energy market operator, scaled up for the project's electricity demand in the ZCA scenario, which will be shown to be 40% higher. The blue line is the electrical output from the 23 wind sites throughout the year. We need a power source that is flexible and can always match the difference between demand and wind supply. This power, of course, is based on concentrated solar thermal energy. When we bring in electricity from the 12 solar regions represented in the dark orange, you can see that because it is dispatchable, it is able to meet demand most of the year round. Solar thermal electricity can be dispatched from generators using molten salt storage tanks to fill the gap between the amount of wind coming into the grid and the amount of electricity we need to supply to meet demand at any time. And for the short times, where there isn't enough solar or wind power, a combination of existing hydroelectricity and a small amount of crop waste biomass is used to co-fire the molten storage tanks in order to ensure 100% demand is met. So how will we build all this and transition in the next 10 years? Part 6 looks at, in detail, the resource requirements to build the infrastructure. It quantifies all the major commodities and the ability to scale the labour force to meet the work requirement needed. To get the job done in 10 years, although it is not mandated, the materials and production we supplied locally, it is useful to be able to compare this with what is in our economy today. Here are a couple of examples. To build the two the twelve three hundred and fifty sorry excuse me, to build the twelve three and a half thousand megawatt solar regions, we would require a peak manufacturing production of six hundred thousand heliostats and thirty concrete towers a year. Heliostats are a simple technology with only thirteen different components. Pouring concrete into the, the pouring the concrete towers that hold the central receivers requires a team of 20 people and a continuous pour for six weeks. Job done. Wind is another example. This is Portugal's Enercon wind turbine factory. Built in one year, it produces 250 towers a year and employs 400 people. In terms of total resources, looking at how much steel and concrete we will need, for example. It is a fraction of what Australia uses today. We already pour 60 million tonnes of concrete a year in Australia. We'd require less than 7% of that production per year to be delivered or diverted to provide the cleanest concrete production needs. Similarly with steel, if you look at what Australia produces domestically, we'd need 20 to 30% of our steel production. However, if you take into account all of Australia's steel exports, you will find that is a, quite a small percentage to the total steel that Australia has resource-wise. Now, how about labour requirements? The plan would create 40,000 jobs and new jobs in operation and maintenance. This would continue for the life of the wind and solar plants. This would be more than enough to replace the 20,000 jobs today in the domestic fossil fuel industry, supplying coal, oil and gas for Australia to be used, used shown here in black. Secondly, manufacturing half of the required wind turbines and solar thermal mirrors in Australia would create another 30,000 jobs, which could then continue as an export industry. These could all be located in places like La Trobe and La Hunter Valley, where there is cold communities. Thirdly, to build everything, we'd need a peak construction workforce of 75,000 people. Part seven is the economic cost of the plan. The projected cost Productions of wind and solar th thermal power is a good news story. The first of the kind plant technology is always going to be expensive, but the more you build, the cheaper they get. The plant's costing is based on the today's project cost for solar thermal, wind, and transmission, but takes into account the cost reductions which will occur due to a large rollout. <coughs> this graph is some of the data on the solar thermal costs used in the ZCA plan. It shows that solar thermal cost reduction curve, mapped out by the US Department of Energy and one of America's leading engineering firms, Sargent and Lundy. The actual data shown is the cost of electricity in megawatt, is dollars per megawatt hour for energy, all of the way up to 220 megawatt units, converted to Australia's dollars and calculated at commercial planning. 
increasing interest rates. Their work mapped out in detail on how solar thermal power towers come down the cost reduction curve the more we build. A prominent example of this is how much the heliostat field in blue comes per megawatt hour. This is due to the efforts of mass manufacturing supplying a large industry rather than any R&D breakthroughs. This is basically the same to effect that has made solar TV panels, big screen televisions and mobile phones much cheaper than they were 10 years ago. In looking at the total cost of the plan, we see ensuring a safe climate future as a bargain at 3% of our GDP, investing $370 billion over the 10 years to make this plan a reality. This is $37 billion a year in a $1,200 billion per year economy. In comparison, each year Australia spends $23 billion on insurance and almost $20 billion on gambling. It is a pretty poor, poor bet to insure your home and contents without insuring the climate on which it depends. And it is important to note that this would be a mixture of public and private money. In the short term, renewable energy needs a price support policy that allows a level playing field. This makes it viable for private companies to invest capital. To recap and conclude, Australia must act now to zero emissions, 100% renewable energy, and to secure our climate energy supply in our future. The ZCA plan shows that it is technically doable, like solar thermal power, using existing technologies already commercially available. The transition has been fully researched and resourced and will provide tens of thousands of new, secure jobs for Australians. And it has been fully costed. So it comes down to a choice that Australians have to make. Remembering that solar thermal plants and coal plants are similar, they both create heat, which is used to boil steam, and drive a turbine to create electricity. The difference is solar thermal uses mirrors, whereas coal plants burn coal. The rest of the generating infrastructure is largely, largely equivalent same generator turbines and solar thermal receiver towers are similar heights to smokestacks. Over the next 30 years, each one square metre of mirror that we install in our solar thermal plants will save burning 20 tonnes of coal over the 30 year lifespan of the plan. Or put another way, for every one square mirror, metre of mirror that we choose not to install, we are choosing to burn 20 tonnes of coal and putting 72 tonnes of CO2 into the atmosphere for the next 30 years. So that is the plan in all of its essence. And now this is what you can find out if you would like to help NZE and their plan may become a reality. If you would like, you can purchase the plan for $30, which is largely a uh, donation to the research. Or conversely, you can download it for free on if you Google Beyond Zero Emissions or BZE. You can get a synopsis, which is 20 pages, or you can get the full 200 page plan. One of the way, main ways that we communicate with our ongoing activities is via our monthly newsletter. Um, remember to actually, ah, my helper Rebecca here has a clipboard. If you're interested, you can sign your email address down there and you can become a part of this. Or you can contribute as a volunteer. The Zero Carbon Australia Transport, Building and Land Use Plan are all looking for technical contributors. Our communications, media and administration teams are also looking for volunteers. Details on how to contribute will all be found on the website. This report is the result of a group of really intelligent and dedicated people volunteering their time pro bono in a coordinated manner. To utilise these people's commitment and time, Beyond Zero Emissions employs a skeleton staff, research directors and administrators to direct and enable our great volunteers. To produce this plan, as you can see, in a traditional research organisation would cost at least $2 million. The ongoing communication, political briefings and talks would also be another major cost. Being a non-for-profit and having expert committed volunteer contributors allows us to produce high quality, independent work at a fraction of the cost. So if you're inspired by the ZCA project, we ask you to consider becoming a regular monthly base load supporter. Join the hundreds of Australians who are donating $25 a month to secure our ongoing research and communications program. By becoming a base load supporter, you'll be joining a team of Australians who are working hard to make the Zero Carbon Australia vision a reality. All donations are tax deductible and all the forms are on the website if you're interested.
I'd like to thank you for your time. Are there any